Tom Quay presents The Royal Ramble, an episode-by-episode celebration of the classic British sitcom The Royal Family. To get in touch with the show, email us at theroyalramblepod at gmail.com. Hey everyone, it's Tom here, back with yet another episode of The Royal Ramble. I hope this finds you well. I'm currently recording this on the last day of 2021, and I'm in a hotel room as well, so please excuse any noises you might hear behind me. Just in this introduction, there's my neighbour just listening constantly, his mawkish, horrible covers music. But anyway, we're here to talk about The Royal Family. This is, of course, another edition of my deep dive show, where it's just myself, Tom Quee, going very, very in-depth on, in my opinion, one of the greatest programmes ever put to screen the royal family now just before we jump into today's episode which coincidentally is probably my favorite episode of the show though uh, there's like five or six that are kind of vying for that top spot really and there isn't a bad episode it's been a joy to put this whole thing together edition by edition and that is credit to all the performers all the writers and just you know everyone involved in this masterpiece so before we get into the criticism and before we get into the only email of today i just want to do a little bit of housekeeping here so of course as always you can email the show yourself with any of your royal family thoughts that's the royal ramble pod at gmail.com you can also follow us at twitter that's at royal ramble pod you can you know you can find all these in the description notes all the episodes as well and we also have a patreon so if you enjoy the show and you really want to give back to the show you can help support us on patreon.com forward slash the royal ramble and basically what that means is you support me month by month and whenever an episode drops on here So in this case, today's episode is the fifth episode of the second series. That's Barbara's finally had enough. Whenever that drops on here, I have also dropped the next episode on the Patreon. So if you go support us on the Patreon right now, and if you just can't get enough of the Raw Ramble, you can listen to my in-depth celebration of Anthony's birthday. And I actually recorded and edited that while I've been away here. And that has just been a particular joy to put together. I mean, there's so many astonishing scenes in that episode. So yeah, we've got the Patreon, we've got the email, we've got the Twitter. What else is there? YouTube as well. Upload everything on YouTube want to subscribe over there if you prefer to listen over there or on spotify uh, itunes as well if you could leave us a five star itunes review that's greatly appreciated we've got a few actually uh, just over the last couple of weeks and they just you know help us push us up the algorithms i know that a podcast about the royal family is never necessarily going to be troubling the charts or anything like that but um you know the feedback from you guys and the engagement it kind of all makes it worth it and so just before we start our discussion of the episode we have our only email which comes from daniel and he says hi tom i've been a huge fan of the royal family for as long as i can remember i'm the same age as yourself i was born in 1992 and i remember being very young and watching the show with my dad my dad got me into some great shows including only fools and horses porridge open all hours and the two runnies to name a few and as much as i enjoyed the the show when I was younger. I don't think I really appreciated it until I was older. I have to agree with you how most of the specials are nowhere near as good as the original three seasons. I'm actually from the town, Runcorn in Cheshire, which is where Two Pints of Lager and a Packet of Crisp was filmed and starred our very own Basin Head. So I really appreciate your podcast. Don't mind me, Tom. I'll listen to any old shite. I love how in-depth you go and genuinely look forward to new episodes. I'm actually about to start watching Early Doors for the first time after hearing how good it is from yourself, and I'm really looking forward to it. Anyway, I'm off to Darren's. Keep up the great work. It really is appreciated. All the best, Daniel. And Daniel, thank you for that email. Again, guys, if you want to get in touch, the Raw Pod at Juma.com. And, um, you know, cool that we're in the same boat, really. Both born in 92. Both remember the show from our childhood. You know, I've mentioned this quite a lot in the pod. I remember watching it. And it just, I think what stuck with me more than anything was just how real it felt. Even as a six, seven year old, I was like, this is so different to, you know, any kind of laughter track, whatever that I was digesting at the time. And those are some great shows that your dad got you into as well. I've got, I've got to say, Open All Hours and Two Runnies never really clicked with me, but Only Fools and Porridge, I worship both of those. And Porridge, actually, it's kind of been fun with Porridge because I realised, I used to watch it with my dad when I was young as well, Only Fools I know quite well, but Porridge on kind of episodes here and there. But I've just been slowly watching on iPlayer over the last couple of weeks. And, like, there's so many ones I don't remember that are just absolutely fantastic. And, you know, one of them's very, very Royal Family-esque, which I'm sure you'll be aware of, Daniel. I'm sure many of our listeners will be i think it's called like in all night or something where it's just fletcher and gobber just chatting about life into the wee hours and yet as well daniel i've been very happy to hear that you're getting into early doors let me know how that gets on i know a lot of folk who listen to this show are like me absolutely rabid about that show as well and we will get there dear listeners don't worry when i'm done with royal family i'm jumping straight into early doors it's going to be about a year and a half two years at the rate we're doing one episode a month but we will get there anyway cheers again daniel and let's get into episode five of series two which is Barbara's finally had enough this is directed by Steve Bendelak written by Carolyn Ahern Craig Cash and Carmel Morgan and it first debuted on the 21st of October 1999 
So let's get into it. And, you know, the hype for this episode in general through myself throughout this run and others that I've spoken to and emailed in. I mean, you know, it's been reaching fever pitch. This is generally cited as the best episode of the show or certainly in the top three. I mean, the millionaire episode is probably how most people remember it. And that is undeniably an unbelievable segment. But for me, it's the main storyline of Barbara finally snapping, finally having enough. I mean, we've seen her get flustered, get upset at Jim, angry, shouting, but never actually leaving the house, leaving the tangible universe of the show in some ways. And to let us know from the off that things aren't right, the television is off, the natural burbling soundtrack for the majority of the show, whether you noticed it or not, has been shut off at the spigot. And in pretty much every episode up to this point, we've either opened with the sound of television, like the pilot, for example, or a direct shot of the television, like in the opening episode of the second series, where we see Judith Chalmers on Wish You Were Here. But here, the TV's off for some reason. It's off, but Jim is still staring into it as he nods, and here for a moment we get this weird, bizarro reflection world on the black mirror of the TV, an inverse of the classic opening credits. Here Jim is on the counter, in a sense, in the pallid colour of the TV screen, which mixes his own tired aesthetic with that of the shut-off CRT. And rather than the flickering blue of the actual opening, Jim is distant and sketched out in a few rough marks. And this is a very, very subtle thing. I don't know if this is intended, but as the camera's fixed on the TV, just under the right side of the TV, we can see that the plug socket, it's, it's plugged in, basically. The electricity is working, then, it seems. And this TV has been shut off by some external malicious force. We can hear shuffling. We can hear someone shuffling with something heavy in the background as Jim is just watching on vacantly, forlorn, unsure what to do. The doorbell then rings amongst this lifting, and Jim is cut to in his chair, paper folded on his paunch. He reaches for the remote, which is facing the doorway to the kitchen, and then upon seeing Barbara storm past, he jerks himself back like a child touching the stove. He is sheepish here, shy and retiring, not wanting trouble, it seems, not wanting to stir anything. Something or someone has clearly exploded. So Barbara goes by in darker garments than usual, kind of perhaps emphasising her highly emotional pain state. She storms past, telling Jim not to worry, that she'll get it. And, you know, I don't think we've actually ever seen Jim open the door for anyone, come to think of it. We're going to see Jim do something new at the end of this episode that stuns the rest of the cast. But, uh, yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit. With the coast then clear for a moment as Barbara is welcoming Dave and Denise in, Jim seizes his opportunity and his clicker, satisfyingly switching the TV on. You don't really see that anymore, do you, where the sort of picture blooms, the blossom of a signal for a second, and as the telly switches on, we see a snow owl of some sort, you know, animal hospital or the like, of course. On the TV, the narrator says, can't see any wounds or anything, and a vet is treating a bird. Is this a reference to the episode? You know, I like to think so, and, you know, it's my podcast, so feel free to disagree if you if you don't believe this, the Raw Ramble Pod at gmail.com. But for me, this is a, uh, a lurch towards the psychological damage that Jim has wrought for Barbara, maybe. You know, can't see any wounds or anything. You know, certainly something to keep in mind of in this episode. And, like, not to get too morbid, but, you know, Jim, I imagine, has never hit Barbara, like Betty and the joiner in Leeds. But, you know, the damage he's done on her mentally is no doubt, you know, pretty devastating. I mean, can you imagine living with Jim and cleaning up after him? I mean, he's lovable, for sure. You know, he's got a good one-liner always in the back pocket, but I think it'd take its toll. And as Jim turns on the TV, we can only hear the rumblings from the corridor and um, they don't even seem like greetings for instance you could kind of piece it together what's happening you know you imagine that Barbara obviously looks upset as she opens the door Dave can be heard to say hello and then Denise does and then you can hear her pretty soon after saying ma'am as if she notices there that something's not right all right Barbara hey ma'am can't see any wounds mm-hmm. or anything there. it's really lively which is great oh, ma'am And the pair then split off, and Dave heads alone into the lounge while Denise escorts Barbara to the kitchen, where we can hear her giving another ma'am, here more concerned this time. So Dave then greets Jim, Jim gives a hiya that sounds weary, Dave watches TV for a second of course, and then asks Jim about Barbara, saying that she looks a bit upset. Barbara, whose ashtray is interestingly on the sofa next to Dave, so perhaps she left it there in a rage or something, you know, she didn't put it back on the table. It's kind of Dave to ask after her. He says she's gone in the kitchen with Denise. Jim doesn't seem to think anything is wrong, though, and is strongly, of course, in denial. What's up with Barbara, Jim? She looks a bit upset. Denise has gone in the kitchen with her. 
Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. It, it's the menopause. The menopause, of course, the menopause, the menopause rearing its head back up as it tends to do. You know, it's been mentioned most recently in the Sunday afternoon episode. And here it is again, tackled head on. The change, Jim says, he's had it up to here with it, you know, raises his hand above to his forehead for emphasis. Great acting by Ricky, managing to sound both fatigued by the situation and still sincere as if he's been wronged in some way. He's had to go through it too. You know, it's ridiculous, really. And then we cut into the kitchen. And, you know, oh, my God, I love these constant cuts between the two of them. I think this is absolutely inspired. The two pairs of the youngsters and the parents, as it were. So we go into the kitchen and they cut into this incredibly well set up shot. One of my truly favorite constructions of the entire royal family. Barbara is leaned up, seemingly emptied, defeated, Siggy in hand, propping up her overworked head. Another ashtray on top of the fridge. We've never seen her like this before. We've never seen her in this corner of the kitchen either. Her oversized shirt scrunched at the bottom as she grasps it defeatedly, trying to explain, looking to her daughter for consolation, but obviously getting zilch from old Denise. Denise, who is there beside her, arms folded, close in listening to her mum, but not really listening. You know, it's a sad reality that happens far too often, I imagine. A parent distraught with their partner who then seek solace within a product of the union of themselves and their partner. It's tough, you know, I'm just a skivvy, is how the scene starts. Yeah, and this is the 11th episode of the show, so we've spent quite a fair amount of time with the Royals to this point, and, you know, it's pretty undeniable that she kind of is his skivvy. And, and what is a skivvy? I mean, you can kind of obviously work out what a skivvy is, you've probably heard the term skivvy before, but I just want to check that out myself, we are the Royal Ramble, of course. It is a British informal term, referring to a female domestic servant who performs menial tasks. Also, a person doing work that is poorly paid and considered menial. So, I mean, that's, she's probably doing stuff like that in the bakery, you know, she's swept up her feet there, really, and she's clearly having to put in a shift in for old Titty for Lou and, you know, all the flexi time and all that kind of debacle and here you know she can't escape at a home either as we've touched on before this situation has always been boiling of course in the background but it seems that perhaps nana's elongated stay exacerbated the situation and barbara then paints out clearly her issues and who can blame her here i'm just as bloody skivvy it was worse when your nana was staying I'd come home from work and that sink would be full of pots. They'd be fighting and I just wanted to get my coat on and go somewhere. After working all day and coming to no help on a domestic front, her husband and her closest family member fighting, I mean, what a hell, really. And the way Sue Johnson delivers that line to the desperation and get my coat on and go somewhere. You know, but where? I mean, what life does she have outside of this home, realistically? It's, you know, difficult, but she doesn't really have the feathers, I guess. Nana's too far away. I mean, the precinct's there. Could she go to Mary? Could they confide in that way? You know, we've seen them exchange glances when Jim's been in one of those more ruxious moods. But um, she doesn't have much, does she, old Barb? I mean, even her daughter is no real help, no real comfort. You know, Denise tries to show sympathy somewhat, though. Rubs her arm and then attacks Jim for being really lazy. Quite rich as ever, but little changes with Denise. You know, perhaps in some far-flung future, it's Dave decrying how lazy Denise is. Tears in the kitchen at his last ebb. I mean, maybe not. You imagine Dave's just going to get rolled over forever, doesn't mind being the skivvy. But, you know, everyone has their breaking point. Even weird future Dave that clearly isn't Dave. He hasn't got any hobbies as well that Barbara gets into. Nice pivot. Really economical. I mean, this shows how sweet she is as well. Despite all of his terrible habits and overall attitude, she still loves him, wants the best for him, tries to think of things for him to do. Because, I mean, he's retired, I guess. Which always gets me that line. I mean, it's so tender from Barb. But what happens when she tries to? I mean, why? This kind gesture gets chucked back in her face, of course. I try and think of things for him to do. He does the crossword in the paper, right? So I bought him a puzzler the other day and he just went mad. He said I'd wasted £1.70 and he wouldn't speak to me for the rest of the night. But it's not a life, this. It's just a bloody existence. Jim enjoys the crossword. Interesting. I mean, fairly typical habit. I'm a bit of a crossword fiend myself, I have to admit, really. And uh, Call It The Puzzler gets mentioned too. I mean, an actual brand. Couldn't really find any history of The Puzzler online. But you guys know what The Puzzler is. And anyone overseas that listens, I mean, it's just kind of a... They're in news agents everywhere, aren't they? These bumper crop of puzzles and stuff like that. But what is a crossword, I hear you ask? Well, a crossword is a word puzzle that usually takes the form of a square or rectangular grid of white and black shaded squares. The game's goal is to fill the white squares with letters, forming words or phrases by solving clues which lead to the answers. The phrase crossword puzzle was first written in 
1862 by our young folks in the United States. Crossword-like puzzles, for example, double diamond puzzles, which were their known precursor, appeared in the magazine St. Nicholas, published since 1873. On December 21st, 1913, Arthur Wynne, a journalist from Liverpool, published a word cross puzzle in the New York world that embodied most of the features of the modern genre. The puzzle is frequently cited as the first crossword puzzle and Wynne as the inventor, and an illustrator later reversed the word cross name to crossword. Okay, look, Jim doesn't appreciate money being wasted, even though in this case, this is something really sweet on Barbara's behalf. And just the cost of the gesture alone is enough, but no, you know, he doesn't see the bright side of this. And things then swing from the macro to the micro. Barbara despairs the drudgery of her life in terms of the puzzler and domestic chores, and then it pans further out wide. It's not a life, this, she says. It's just a bloody existence. And that is just, man, that that is shaking. I, I bet at this point, she wished she went with bushy-eyed Charlie Rogers. I mean, Barbara, too, throughout this scene, looks like we've never seen her before. She looks beaten. She looks scooped out, her elbow leaning on the fridge, supporting the weight of her depressed brow. And Denise is kind of listening, and he's always got bits of food in his beard, she adds, stirring the pot. But, of course, that's a kind of minor quibble. Like, you maybe say that after the puzzler stuff. You wouldn't say that about when your mom says, this isn't a life, you know what I mean? That is just, you can't really, you're not really going down the same avenue there, are you? I mean, that's fixable the food and the beard, and kind of to be expected, really, if you have a beard. It's superficial, is what I'm saying, rather than indicative of the brutal reality of Jim's personality that is now being interrogated in the kitchen. You know, it's really such a scene. Both characters not quite catching each other. Barbara with the grand statements, and Denise, you know, still trying to get a craw in slightly when she can. And to the revelation from Denise of him having bits of food in his beard, Barbara comes in hot. You know, he never has a wash, she says. And yet, I mean, how regular do you reckon Jim does wash? Like, what does Jim smell like? His clothes certainly suggest an aversion to all things soapy. You know, he'd say maybe it's for saving money, the immersion and such. But in reality, it means he doesn't have to get off his fat ass and then wash his fat ass. Following the claim that he never has a wash, we then cut back to Jim, whom from behind we can see washing drying on the rack. And that cut from the kitchen into the lounge is really interesting too however as you can tell barb is about to say something else pile it on further but it's cropped as we go back to jim jim who is trying to make sense of it how long does it last this change malarkey he asks i mean an ignorant question to begin with but certainly not one you ask dave best kind of reminds me when denise learns that anthony is talking it over with dave in another woman on the tv we can hear convicted wrong and rolf harris in the background as dave says he thinks it lasts a few years and yeah according to age uk the menopause usually continues for around four years after your last period though some women's symptoms continue for much longer well then back into the kitchen and just these quick quick cuts this is the most dynamic editing the show's ever seen and it, it really worked in its favor back into the kitchen and barb is saying that the only time jim has a wash is when he goes to the doctors which i find kind of hard to believe i mean jim we know is derisive of pretty much all authority so why would he why does he respect them in that way is he embarrassed in some section i don't really know i mean besides denise as well again i've got my eyes on the kitchen as well as the people in it we can see a plump bottle of brown sauce to daddy's probably in the classic glass next to some butter you know i'm not sure why i'm pointing this out but again it's the raw ramble Barbara then changes tact, focuses not on how Jim is with her, but how he is with others. Nana, we learn, had a face like thunder last week as he wouldn't put her drops in. I guess, which is related, of course, to the cataracts. Which is kind of harsh, really. I mean, she was down for an actual operation and was then recovering at the Rawls. But perhaps this was after the Revels incident, so then it's kind of understandable. The timelines are tough to work out. So he's not kind to Nana, of course, but even to his own flesh and blood too, his son. Yeah, not kind then either. Poor Anthony. Got no confidence. Jim's knocked it all out of him, calling him a lankish streak of piss all the time. Well, well, he has got a point there. Funny ending there, with Denise concurring that he has got a point, but yeah, yeesh. Very sad to consider the absolute truth that Barbara's spewing. Their son is the way he is, which to be fair is just a slightly gawky teenager so you know he would have been that way anyway maybe but no doubt Jim has had an impact with his endless insults and put downs I mean there's banter Christ I hate that word uh you know and then there's the constant barbs of Jim and this is his wife saying this Anthony's mother who sees it for what it is and then we're back again with Jim and Dave you know this is something quite novel for the show these kind of zippy scenes and I mean yeah they are still just standing or sitting chatting in them but still (laughs) you know they're enthralling Jim then asks Dave if his mom has had a change, which is just hilarious. I mean, obviously Dave has no insight. 
He pauses for a second, thinks on it dolefully, turns to Jim and says, she's not said now. (laughs) Which is just perfect and also kind of heartbreaking. I mean, you know, people for the most part don't really speak on this, do they? Certainly not in these types of families with these types of men during these types of times. And she's not said now is so good. I mean, if you break it down as a sentence, it means she may have said something, but that's obviously not how Dave means it. But obviously Dave is saying, like Barbara, that she is silenced. She has suffered, no doubt, you know, in her muteness, which is um, which is just sad, really. I mean, just another kind of domestic casualty on that front, I suppose. Then we're back to Venise and Barbara, and you can tell that Barbara is properly in pain here, the ciggy in her hand, dishes drying behind her that she no doubt washed, proclaiming that for most of the time she put up with it when you two were young, which implies perhaps there were other incidents of her leaving, or maybe just her having a go back or a breakdown. Barbara then starts to cry and you know as always Sue Johnston's acting is to be commended she's amazing in every scene but in this scene in particular doing that like again I don't act don't know about acting but you know crying convincingly is difficult and we can all think of times in tv and film where it's like come on now you know but she's doing a lot of the things very well here she's doing the choking back the tears you know the eyes scrunching your your body getting concave Denise notices it sees the body language and grows silent the only sound the whirring of the kitchen fan you know we can see here that really barbara has had enough you know we haven't seen her in this mode before the details here too the the fact that she taps her cigarette in the ashtray as she's breaking down not one to make a mess oh just perfect so denise i mean she's oblivious denise for the most part but even she notices what's happening here puts an arm around barb and then Bob just responds with a sucker punch. Aww. No, I don't know why I'm here, Denise. Oh, Aww. You could come and live with us. No, you could. Oh, Denise. Because when that baby's born, I'm going to be rushed off my feet. <laughs> hey? I mean, that is just mortifying, isn't it, really? Um, wounding to hear and you know because this is a family we all love and who wants to see any family breakup who wants to see the matriarch in such pain you know i don't know why i'm here and you know denise has kind of grown and moved out at this point and anthony's getting there got a girlfriend whilst managing a band like why is she here what is the point i mean she loves jim of course but she's also under the cosh emotionally psychologically domestically You know, and it's so sad to see her breaking like this. Denise taking her by the shoulders. You could come and live with us, Denise offers non-thinkingly. Barbara shoots her a look as if to say, come on now. But I guess she's at a loss what to say. I mean, you know, Denise did grow up in all of this. Her kind of idea of kind of domestic roles has maybe been warped in that sense. But obviously it's not come live with us, seek refuge from Jim, you know, be treated as an elder in the house. It's come live with us because I need a babysitter. Stating that when the baby's born, this is Denise, I'm going to be rushed off my feet. To which Barbara puts her hand up to her head and cries even deeper. You know, I'm not laughing at her crying, but it's I think it's just her despair here. It's like, fuck, my kid as well is like this, you know. Um, it's perhaps partly in response to that, but maybe mostly just for Jim and, you know, that she's kind of just digging deeper mentally into her Jim woes. We're then back to Jim and Dave. And it's weird to think that this is happening right next door, literally with an earshot of each other, all this is going on. Jim relays a dispatch from the war zone, stating that Barbara had gone too far this time. Bang, she just switched the telly off. I love the shocked, wide-eyed reaction of Dave here. There's a lot of shocked Dave in this episode. Definitely look out for that. The television, as we discussed on The Royal Family, is, you know, a constant thing, a living thing that is not to be disrespected. And Jim says, that's what I mean, with some smugness, as if he's completely a I mean, it's, it's very funny and very infuriating, which is just great writing. And from this just quick shot of the boys there, we're back to a sobbing Barbara, truly upset, finally able to let her feelings out and unable to cork them back in. Denise is rubbing Barbara's back, kindly, trying to reassure her, let her know that she's there, but of course, like her father and like Nana, it really is kind of all about Denise in Denise's world, so she asks her mother if she likes her top, (laughs) and it's interesting that she does that, because we've seen in past episodes how attentive that Barbara is at noticing things, noticing Denise's shoes, asking about tees, Denise's leggings from the market, asking Twiggy about Little Lee, etc., so, you know, Denise is clearly out of sorts here, expecting that there'll be loads of praise lavished on her top, 
soon as she got in, but no, she's greeted with her mother, like, just on the precipice. The deep draw of sorrow that ends this brief scene from Barbara is kind of chilling. You know, she's desolate. It's agony to watch and hear. Back to Jim now, who's breaking down the mechanics of the relationship. He's not one of those husbands who goes out every night. Okay, maybe that's something in his favour, you're thinking, you know. But it's only because he can't afford it. <laughs> I'm not one of them husbands that goes out every night. Admittedly, I would be if I could afford it. I have two nights and one afternoon a week, and it's still not bloody good enough. Mm, I don't want to get involved, Jim. Again, as if that's a sacrifice on his part. As if he's doing Barbara a favour, whose money he's probably spending there. I mean, some of his gyro, I imagine, but also the money that Barbara's putting back into the household. And, you know, what are his nights then? Or is he just speaking generally? Does he mean he heads out on a weekend and maybe a Wednesday? Does he have a certain thing there? I mean, we have seen them leave a fair few times to the feathers just on a whim. So is that going against his tally there? Or is it like in the last episode where he's just trying to always get an excuse to get out there via Dave or someone else? <laughs> Darts final, etc. And Dave is understandably awkward, you know, in the middle of things here saying he doesn't want to get involved, kind of cringing here. And there's a nice choice of camera cut as it's been far off with Jim at the back and us over Dave's side. Then it goes back to Dave with Jim blurred at the edge, stating, she does work hard though. And Dave's gritted delivery there is terrific. And, and doesn't she just as well? We've seen it so much in our own eyes as viewers and Dave even more so off camera. Jim, like Denise in there, doesn't really seem to listen properly to what is being said to him by the youngster who is, uh, you know, their audience, and just takes it on face value. So with Dave saying how hard she works, he's not just talking about the bakery, Jim, but of course, that's how Jim responds. A couple of bloody hours in the bakery, he says. I mean, again, head in hands listening, but just, you know, terrific kind of dual writing here. I love it. Dave again winces, hmms, says he doesn't want to get involved. It's now to do with him, which, yeah, it isn't really, but he is now part and parcel of the family and it will affect him. So kind of he has to get stuck into a certain extent. But of course, this is just a rupture, really, isn't it? An anomaly in the Barb and Jim ongoing saga. It's not a pattern going forward. Feelings are pushed down and bottled up after this one and things kind of carry on as normal, as sad as that is. Once more, we head back into the kitchen and there's not even any dialogue in this momentary shot. Denise is just further trying to confront Barbara, who is weeping again, attempting to sup her cigarette through the crying. It's just a snatch of seconds before we go back to Jim with a real rich claim. I love that too. I mean, how arty is that? Just one quick shot, like 10 seconds, no dialogue, just kind of, you know, filling you in what's going on in the interim, and then we're back to Jim. Jim, who's claiming that the trouble with him, apparently, is that he's too easy bloody going. I mean, oh... That is staggering, really, that he believes this. Riotous, too. I mean, the irony is perfect. When she does work in the bakery, we learn, Jim's tea can be late, half seven, quarter to eight. But he doesn't moan, he just gets up with it. Again, very hard to believe this. And how entrenched are these values? Like, I know Jim's like a man of the 60s or whatever, but yeesh, you know, he can't cook his own tea or cook for her. You know, he mentioned at the close of the episode that it's sausages and such, but no, he has to be a miser, I guess. Barbara's back in the kitchen now, pulling herself together a little, it seems. Wiping her tears and blowing her nose with a tea towel, stating that Jim's got no conversation about him. I mean, she had earlier said in an episode that he had no imagination too, and, you know, okay, that was in reference to the DIY possibilities of the home, but you can see what she means. You know, he certainly isn't a doting husband, attuned to his wife's needs and wants. Again, too, Sue Johnson's delivery here is just, yeah, wonderful. The way he hated it is really pushed out with such bile. And where did Jim work? I'm obsessed with this fact, and I don't think we ever get to know. You know, and she says this, as she's talking, she's looking into the ashtray with some anger, seeming to look back on herself, perhaps, into herself, revealing that she imagined a whole new... This is just tragic, isn't it, this bit? Imagined a whole new side of Jim would emerge upon leaving work. Denise isn't really that interested or invested, clearly. She goes for a chocolate bar, a club, of course. But it's a really deep comment from Barb. It's quite upsetting, really, when you consider the realities. That he was, in fact, even worse, perhaps, when he was working, when there were young kids around. You know, well, he certainly wasn't better. And there's something quite poetic in the way that it's written that she perceived that there was this whole kind of, you know, other side, dark side of the moon, if you will, of Jim. A kind of whole area she'd never really seen, never really been displayed. But she was seeing the whole thing. You know, there, there, there wasn't that. There isn't another side to him. You know, just what she says that, I always thought that when he gave it up, I'd see a lovely side of Jim that I'd never seen before. There isn't one. You know, something to which Denise agrees with, with a mouthful of club, you know, but she's enthusiastic and she's got some spite in her now. You know, it's clearly won over to Barbara's side in this case. 
Barr then starts talking about HRT. HRT being hormone replacement therapy, also known as menopausal hormone therapy or postmenopausal hormone therapy, is a form of hormone therapy, gotta say that a lot, used to treat symptoms associated with the female menopause. These symptoms can include hot flashes, uh, vaginal atrophy, <laughs> accelerated skin aging, vaginal dryness, uh, sexual dysfunction, and bone loss. They are in large part related to the diminished levels of sex hormones that occur during the menopause. And, you know, this is a thread now running throughout the show, isn't it? The menopause and Barbara's relationship with it, along with its relationship with the family, but, you know, primarily Jim. And, you know, of course, it isn't good news. You know, you know that when she talks about bringing this up with Jim, it's not going to be a small upswing of husbandly attention and care. Nope. Denise plays the rapper listening in, rocking her inverted silver screen shirt, along with the 90s Clarissa Explains It All blossom pink jumper tied to her waist. I mean, you know, she looks great. I mean, Karen Ahern, she has that kind of old school starlet duskiness, doesn't she, to qualify as one of the bygone stars that are on her top, to be honest with you. So the doctor tells Barb about HRT to talk it over her husband, which is, you know, and obviously Jim's response is to be expected. And, you know, it's delivered expertly here by Barb, who you can really hear her husband's voice through her because who in fact knows him better than Barb? You know, the doctor said about this HRT thing. He said, have a little think and go discuss it with your husband. All Jim could say was, that HRT's horse is piss and that them doctors are raking it in. I mean, what he says, of course, is hilarious. Denise seems to concur with it slightly, which we'll get to. HRT is horse's piss, Christ. I mean, obviously not meant literally, but yet again, Jim attacking people who have money, the doctor's raking it in. You know, remember Jim at the Sunday dinner table, we hear about Richard Branson and how, you know, he's tighter than a camel's arsehole in the sandstorm and wouldn't give you the steam of his piss, that fella. Jim's delivery there is so good. And, you know, it's so typical for Jim, you know, to act like those of a higher stature only have their money because they're so stingy. And, and yeah, it's intriguing as well. As Barbara's saying this, you can see Denise break, so to speak. You know, this is only something I've noticed on a few recent rewatches, but she clearly wants to laugh at what she's heard. She's using the chocolate bar to stifle the giggles. It's it's pretty subtle, but you can see her body kind of crease at her dad's insults. I mean, we've seen her laugh loads at her dad before, but of course she can't show that to her mum. I mean, she does care, I feel, but, you know, she couldn't really help laughing at what Barb said, as it is kind of ridiculous HRT as horses piss. And Denise's face here, I mean... The royal family is so grounded in reality, isn't it? But the fact that she's trying to stifle a guffaw, and then Barb looks at her, and then her visage completely swaps to sympathetic and saintly. I mean, it's superb. It's pretty cartoonish, in a way, for the royal family. You know, there are a lot of weird gestures in this show, mostly through Dave. But, you know, it's funny as a concept, as, you know, someone just suddenly put on an unempathetic face, as they're actually kind of laughing at you. And also funny as something that's acted, you know. Denise also shakes her head theatrically at the end, too, as if to hammer home the point. You know, maybe Denise is growing a little bored, perhaps, in a way. I mean, Barbara has been talking for a while and not about her. Uh, Aboard at least in terms of her TV-deprived attention span. You know, we can see after all, directly after the HRT is horse's piss moment, that the men are watching TV. Uh, Rolf Sicko Harris, a matter of a fact. And he is delivering probably what most people remember from Animal Hospital. You know, the heartfelt, gradually teasing tale of a small animal in their hopeful recovery. Ralph is talking about little Sammy and how everyone's wishing for her to pull through when Denise comes in from the kitchen, slams the door behind her, struts up to her dad who is looking at her, wide-eyed, pensive, nervous perhaps, and she then sits down. The camera lingers and then Denise, slumped in her seat, fires off at her dad and asks, Hey dad, what have you said to me ma'am? I mean, Denise knows, of course. It's more of a general thing than literally that she's asking, as, of course, you know, she's just been face-to-face with her mother in the confession box. The camera then zooms quickly from Denise to Jim listening, and Denise asking the painful questions here that I'm sure many people feel about many parental relationships. Why do you always have to upset her, she asks. And, you know, when you think about it, Jim does always seem to go there. I mean, okay, he's not bloody Tyrannosaur or, you know, Distant Voices Still Lives, word to Pete Possilwhite, but you get what I mean. But, of course, Jim doesn't hear it. Jim is gaslighting. You are, Jim says, you know, with the you really at the front there, playing dumb here, like Dave is kind of doing as we pan out, who's just watching the glowing box formlessly and gormlessly. You're always horrible to her, Denise says. And she does kind of know best in that regard. She's certainly an expert. You know, an unfortunate front row viewer of many of Jim's endless comments, both on and off camera. 
You're horrible to Nana too, Denise adds, going through what she's heard in there, but yeah, I mean, he is awful to her too, so so maybe just she had that to add anyway. It's interesting that she didn't add in, however, you're horrible to Anthony as well, because, well, I mean, hypocrisy is a thing, isn't it? Denise is just laying down the facts here, though, really hitting Jim between the eyes, between the glasses, with some home truths. He never say anything nice. He never offered to take her anywhere. Dave, of course, is in shot here as well as Denise is chatting. And you do kind of run these comments as they're being said past them as well. I mean, they're in the first flushes of love, the honeymoon period. So perhaps they're still doing this sort of stuff. But you know, I struggle to think so. Hard to tell. But Jim isn't taking it sitting down, though, from his chair. He fights back and calls out the aforementioned hypocrisy. You're just as lazy as me, he fires back. I mean, he's admitting he's lazy, at least. Hands gripping both of his armrests. The Manchester Evening Standard folding in front of him on the coffee table. And here we have the payoff of a long-running gag, and it is stupendous. Jim is on the attack now, after taking quite a battering from Denise, and with a miserable barber in the kitchen, brings up Denise and her cooking. And anyway, what about you? You're bloody lazier than me, aren't you? I bet you still haven't cooked him a single bloody meal since you've been married, has she, Dave? I have, haven't I, Dave? Not a meal. Oh, shut it, you. I know this has nothing to do with us. This is about you. Damn, you aren't Barbara, basically, it seems to say in some ways. I mean, poor Dave is the victim. And what a response from Dave. Perfect delivery from Craig Cash. Not a meal. I mean, the qualification. We've heard of spaghetti hoops, dairily on toast, Dave getting something from the chippy on the way home, and him also having tea at the chippy after work, as if all of these are meant to be a meal. Denise then punches across the bow at Dave here for his interruption, and tells him to shut up. It's nothing to do with them. It's all to do with Jim, who who she scoffs at again. Jim, who, again, is kind of gaslighting, you know, claims that Barbara has poisoned Denise's mind against him, and she looks off annoyed. Jim plays victim, which is probably a comfortable role for him. It's not just you, but you and your mother as a team. Thick as thieves, he says. He then invokes the unholy trinity by adding in Norma and mimics a cauldron of sorts on the table that he drops. It's really funny acting from Ricky here. And the way he says, Coven can have a go at me, that really gets me. You're as thick as bloody thieves to pair of you. Why don't you just get your nana down here and the whole bloody coven can have a go at me? I tell you what, Dave, you've made a hell of a mistake marrying into this lot, lad. And coven, I mean, coven usually refers to a group or gathering of witches. The word coven, from the Anglo-Norman covent, remained largely unused in English until 1921, when Margaret Murray promoted the idea that all witches across Europe met in groups of 13, which they called covens. Love that Jim drops that reference in there, that arcane reference. I mean, obviously witches are well known and that, but still coven, great word choice. Jim ruefully then informs Dave that he's made a hell of a mistake marrying into this lot. Dave, who's very intimate with the family at this point, of course, literally part of the furniture as he's sloped in his chair. Tempers have been flaring and emotions wrought in and out of the kitchen, but the ice is then broken somewhat by Jim doing what Jim does best artfully changing the whole mood of the conversation through resoluteness and denial in the face of his antics that are obviously responsible for all that's going down in the household. It's humour. That's Jim's real thing, and, you know, she doesn't bloody deserve bloody me, he says with real pomp. And Dave cracks, chuckles to himself, both probably at the sentence construction and the fact that Jim is saying this with him knowing how awful he can be, and that someone who actually deserves Jim would be someone like Jim. (laughs) And Barbara then ain't. You don't deserve her, you. She doesn't bloody deserve bloody me. (laughs) Dave, why do you always take his side? Well, it's your mum's menopause, isn't it? Denise is furious, though, rightly, at this. Dave claims that it's her menopause rather than how Jim is actually treating her, which is terrible, but hilarious and typical too, to be expected. You know, Dave will no doubt in some far-off future say the same about Denise, perhaps. Dave even fights back on Jim's behalf. He's all right, leave him alone, he says, eyes on the TV, with Denise turning to him hawkishly, asking him to keep his big fat nose out of it. It's nothing to do with him, which, again, Dave had just said to Jim before. He didn't want to get involved, but now, (laughs) reluctantly, he's being dragged in. And Dave then actually, there's lots of firsts in this episode, Dave then actually gets quite aggy here for the first time on camera. I mean, we've heard arguments from downstairs in Another Woman when they came in drunk, but that was more of the aftermath from reconciliation there. Whereas here, Dave fires back at her, saying, well, you've brought me in on this argument, haven't you? It's nothing to do with me. Denise comes back with the big guns here, though, clearly outraged, incensed even, beyond what's even happening now with Barbara. I love that there's this fight between the two of them in the middle of a bigger fight between Denise's parents. 
Dave responds to Denise using her pregnancy to prove a point, which we've seen already, her using her pregnancy to get anything she wants, wagon wheels, etc. But Dave is having none of it, really, doing the classic trope of an argument where you fully repeat what the person has just said to you to kind of diminish its impact. So we have the, I'm pregnant, I'm carrying your child, thank you very much. And then Dave's just like, what do you mean you're pregnant, you're carrying my child, thank you very much? You think you're the first person that was ever pregnant? And I mean, damn, how do you, how do you actually go back from that? I mean, it's all coming out here, isn't it? You know, he says it's only the size of an orange. And Denise is brilliant here, acting as if he's showing his ignorance by not knowing the size of it. It's actually a grapefruit. Thank you very much. I mean, everyone's being petty. The three of them. Grapefruit my ass, Jim says. Which, in effect, is saying, my grandchild, my ass. But, yeah, it's just point scoring, isn't it? I mean, correct, Jim, Dave says. Thank you, James. Dave fires back. It's all very childish and uh, point scoring. Now, for me, personally, for my tastes, as you may have noticed, I love metaness, metatextuality in TV and film. When the show itself makes reference in some veiled way to the show itself or some commentary upon the show. So, Dave asks a good question. Why don't we ever go to my mum and dad's? Of course, we will meet them in one of the specials, which we'll eventually get to, but that'll be about a year or so at least in Royal Ramble release schedule time. But yeah, Dave asks why not, and Denise is more than happy to answer him in this genius moment. Anyway... How come we never go around to my mum and dad's? Well, I'll tell you why, Dave. Because they sit on their asses and watch telly all night and it's boring. It's boring. I mean, you've heard her. That's what Denise thinks anyway. The way she drops her head back in declaration and then turns back to him is amazing as well. Majestic. They then talk more about Dave's parents and how he goes around twice a week. So you're like, oh, he goes around twice a week. That's, you know, Norma would love that, you know, having twice a week visits and stuff. But it's only, I mean, this is just classic royal family, isn't it? Set up and pay off. And he's only going around twice a week to drop off his washing and pick it back up. I mean, just brilliant. He's not the uh, studious, caring son, but in actual fact, he's just getting his chores done. Why haven't they offered to do my washing, Denise says. And I love how she qualifies it by how long we've been married. And, you know, it's a weird thing here as well, as we learn that she has a washing machine, Denise does, for 280 notes. But she's never put a thing in it. I mean, that is absolutely exasperating. Like, so how does she wash? Does she bring it back home to the royals for them to wash her stuff? I'm pretty sure they don't have a washing machine. I've not seen one in the kitchen. There could be someone elsewhere, but... I mean, 280 notes is expensive now for a washing machine. And back then, I don't know, 20 years ago or whatever, but in Blair's Britain. But still, back then, that's a lot of money, especially for, like, you know, Dave and such. Well, you try being pregnant, right? And, and Denise can't even get that out. I mean, again, her pregnancy is an excuse, but she gets shut down as bone bloody idol. Amazing tone of Dave here. I mean, this is coming from a grafter, a labourer, someone who puts a shift in. And she can't even put some stuff in a washing machine. I mean, get a grip. But Denise, she always has a comeback. She always has a riposte. She's elegant. And it's pretty convincing, especially the way she delivers it. Leaning back, staring at Dave, who's staring at the TV. 280 bloody no, she's never had a single thing in it. Well, you tried being pregnant, right? And, and what? And nothing, you born bloody idol. I am preparing myself for motherhood. Motherhood, my ass. Correct, Dave. Thank you, James. Motherhood. I mean, great word. Self-important kind of word. Something that Denise has probably read in one of those magazines or the baby book, rather than something that she'd ever really want to embrace. I mean, motherhood, my arse, is all that Dave can muster. And another correct is shot across to him from Jim. Dave thanks James back, of course, and the scene then pauses for a moment. Peace, perhaps, for a second. Focuses on Denise. And then on to Jim, who, now being out of the crossfire, can't help himself but rattle the cage. He asks about the fate of the baby's things and who will clean them. Something to which Denise snaps at, but she has her fury soon stymied as the door closes behind them. Barbara seemingly really has had enough. She's left. The rabble can't believe it. Po-faced, Denise gets up. Apparently says mind to Dave. That came up on the subtitle. She says mind to get him out of the way. It's not in the script, but again, just a really, really nice touch. You can hear Barbara's footsteps too, which I really like. Denise sounds concerned, asks Jim to go after her. Of course, she can't go because she's pregnant. <laughs> Dave can't because he's watching this, pointing at the screen. His face illuminated by the idiot box as he stares up at her for a moment. Jim rationalises that she's probably gone to Mary's, but Denise says she hasn't gone to Mary's. She wonders where she's going and blames Jim again. She's on the change. She might walk out in front of a lorry and get run over. I mean, the sing-song tombra of Denise here is delectable. She's not gone in Mary's. I wonder where she's going. 
It's all your fault. She's on the change. She might walk out in front of a lorry and get run over. Well, we can always put a claim in. <laughs> Denise has never seen her so upset, and, you know, she's probably seen her in some states. She continues as she goes to sit down, getting into it with Jim. You're horrible, you are. Going back to the playground with the stinger that you've broken our home up. I mean, that's like something a child would say more than like a 26-year-old. But, uh, you know, it cuts to the meat of the situation, certainly. You don't live here anymore, Jim reasons. Uh, it's mentioned that Anthony has stormed out before as well. Obviously, Barbara just went. Maybe Denise will be next. It's reason that she's a little too lazy for that, though. And Jim and Denise then start bickering between each other, calling each other the lazy one using Dave as the go-between as they babble this meaningless, brilliant nonsense. Again, trademark of the sort of tidbit nature of arguing, isn't it? She is, he is, they both say to Dave. And then Jim just makes an executive decision, grabs the remote, switches on the TV, and we enter the second act. You know, and I say that not to be grandiose or anything. I mean, most Royal Family episodes are quite formless in a sense that it's just a half an hour spilling out, you know, certain situations rise in and out. But here I would argue there is a kind of genuine free act structure. There is, um, you know, Barbara storming out, which leads us to the millionaire scenes, and then Barbara's return and the and the fraught reconciliation of sorts. So yeah, Jim turns on the TV, and it's Who Wants a Millionaire, which gets a real enthusiastic response from both him and Dave. Dave rocking in his seat, Jim bellowing cheers. And you know, I can remember kind of feeling the same way. Like, you know, I was born in 92. This is around the era when it was really, really big, when I would have been about seven or eight. But I do remember it being on TV. I do remember it being a big thing. And it's really cool as well that the show nods to the other big fish at the time on television. So we've had Changing Rooms have its own section and now Millionaire as well. I mean, these were giant shows of the late 90s, along with Royal Family. And let's talk about Millionaire. Who Wants a Millionaire, often known simply as Millionaire, is an international game show franchise of British origin created by David Briggs, Mike Whitehill and Stephen Knight. And that is the Stephen Knight from Birmingham, by the way, who did Peaky Blinders and wrote one and directed one of my favourite British films of the last 10 years, Locke. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, with Tom Hardy. It's a bit like the Royal Family in the sense where he never leaves his car and he just talks to loads of people on the phone and also deals with his own demons. That's a really, really good film. So Millionaire. In its format, currently owned and licensed by Sony Pictures Television, contestants tackle a series of multiple choice questions to win large cash prizes in a format that twists on many game show genre conventions only one contestant plays at a time similar to radio quizzes contestants are given the question before attempting an answer and have no time limit to answer questions and the amount offered increases as they tackle questions that become increasingly difficult the maximum cash prize offered in most versions of the show is an aspirational value in local currency such as the 1 million pounds in the uk or the 70 million rupees in india the original British version debuted, this is the one that the Royals are watching, on the 4th of September 1998 on the ITV network hosted by Chris Tarrant, who presented his final episode on the 11th of February 2014, after which the show was canned. A revived series of the show aired from 2018, hosted by Jeremy Clarkson, and, um... I mean, look, I really like Millionaire, and, I mean, Clarkson I just despise personally, not a fan of him, and I think he kind of... Like, yeah, I don't watch that version of the show. Kind of, like, you know, it's just not my Millionaire, let's just say that sort of thing. And um, Millionaire, I mean, I, I, I could say so much on this show. Like, I went for a really deep Charles Ingram rabbit hole a few years ago, you know, watching the documentary. Uh, myself and my ex went to go see Quiz in the West End, which was then adapted to, I think it's just called Quiz again, wasn't it, on ITV with um, Michael Sheen. That was a really good show as well, and Ailing B and all that lot. But yeah, like the whole coughing, Tequin Whittock stuff, it's like, I don't know if Ingram did it or didn't do it, but let me know what you think, the Royal Ramble part at gmail.com. It would have been good if maybe they touched on this in Royal Family, but it happened a bit later, didn't it? They're only ever going to do one millionaire episode, so that's fair enough. So um, yeah, the guys are way infused as this show turns on, as are millions of us at the time. This is a giant program. Jim in his seat, wriggling with deep satisfaction in anticipation as Tarrant stands in that famous corridor, his voice booming out as Dave and Jim nod excitedly. And, you know, it's nice to see Jim and Dave as a double team of sorts throughout this episode, both of them backing each other against Barbara and Denise and now just having fun with the game. And one of the things that I really want to ask, if I ever get a chance to speak to Craig Cash or indeed Carmel Morgan, who co-wrote this episode as well, if I ever get a chance to speak to her or him, I want to know, how did they write this section? Because they're reacting to an actual episode of the show here. They're, you know, they can maybe do little edits and stuff to kind of little moments of Arlene on screen, but 
this is a real episode that they've tackled here. You know, they haven't... So, how did, they, did they just kind of sit with notepads and just kind of work out? Did they watch lots of episodes and be like, okay, this is one, because stuff's happening here? Because it's not like they just comment on the questions either. It's like they actually talk about Arlene as a person, they commentate on the lippy and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I just find that really fascinating, you know. It's interesting that... The only ever two shows we see them kind of watch for elongated periods of time, like Antiques Roadshow and like Millionaire, are kind of segmented in such a way. Like with Antiques, it's, you know, we're looking at one thing, with this is one question. It's not like they're reacting to like a film or a narrative, although, of course, we did hear about Tattoo before, but uh, we didn't see them watching it, unfortunately, which would have been amazing. And as you know from listening to this podcast, uh, I'm a big fan of cultural references, historical, trivial references. So any questions of Millionaire that catch my eye, we are going to elaborate a little on those as well. So the first question is actually a fastest finger first question, but it seemed a bit different back in the day. Like my Millionaire that I remember, you had to order things, you know, in historical order or weight or whatever. But here it's just, can you do the right answer first? And the question is, which of these words describes a woven fiber and an ancient people? Now, um, Dave says jute, and it is jute. Persian man, Persian rug, Jim reasons from the options there. And, uh, you know, Dave gets it right, and Denise uses that as a petty opportunity to rub it into Jim. Persian man, Persian rug. I guess B, jute. The answer to the question was... Was jute? Oh, yes. Clever dick. You got that wrong, didn't you? Who was the fastest and next to play? Let's have a look. Who got it right? Dave Best got it right. Dave Best got it right, Dave said. Well, you know, he guessed it right, I suppose. And jute. Jute is one of the most affordable natural fibres and second only to cotton in the amount produced and variety of uses. And it's Arlene that wins on the show, on the TV. You know, a kind of Barbara-like figure in a way, but a bit younger than her, but still a kind of, you know, a mother to a certain extent. You imagine, or or someone who's kind of, you know, at least been married or whatever. We don't know too much about Arlene here, uh, to be honest with you, but you can sort of project, don't you? And the comparisons are kind of made alive by Jim later on. And it's mad, really, for her, for this person. I like to talk to her as well. I actually frequent quite a lot of the Royal Family Facebook groups, and I'm pretty sure someone has shared, like, her actual profile and, like, it is her kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I wonder how this happened. Like, is it... Arlene would have had to been asked if she was happy for this to be on there. Because without this episode, she's just another millionaire contestant of the thousands that have been on Millionaire. But with it, I mean, she's etched into UK comedy history in what is probably the best episode of the show. Her name's Arlene. So, of course, Dave. Dave loves a bit of music. So he'll sing Come On Eileen. Come On Eileen being a song by the English group Dex's Midnight Runners, credited to Dex's Midnight Runners and the Emerald Express, which released in the UK in June 1982 as a single from their album To Rye. It reached number one in the US, and it was their second number one hit in the UK following 1980's Gino. Come On Eileen won Best British Singer at the 1983 Brit Awards, and in 2015, the song was voted by the British public as the nation's sixth favourite 1980s number one in a poll for ITV. It was ranked 18 on VH1's 100 Greatest Songs of the 80s, and was named as Britain's best-selling single of 1982. Now, this is interesting as well, because I didn't realise this song was such a global smash. The song reached number one in the US on the Billboard Hot 100 charts during the week ending the 23rd of April 1983. Common Eileen prevented Michael Jackson from having back-to-back number one hits in the US. Billie Jean was the number one single the previous seven weeks, while Beat It was the number one single the ensuing three. I mean, that's mad that it just cut through the middle of there, and uh, God, what a trio of classic pop that was at the top of the charts then. So Dave sings along, you know, we know Dave likes to sing, Dave enjoys music. He sings along too to the millionaire theme quite a lot there. Doodle and Tarrant, I mean Chris Tarrant briefly, Christopher John Tarrant, OBE, born in October 1946, is an English broadcaster, TV personality, TV personality and former radio DJ. He presented the ITV children's television show Tizwas from 74 to 81 and the game show Millionaire from 1998 to 2014. He was also a capital radio host from 1984 to 2004. And, you know, I quite like Tarrant, actually. I think he's a very good host, a very good game show host. And um, just one little thing I want to mention about him, like, you may remember Spoongate or whatever it was. So, in May 2007, Tarrant was arrested on suspicion of assault in an Indian restaurant and was released on police bail. The incident took place at the Mem Saab restaurant on Maid Marion Way, Nottingham, where Tarrant, who had been joking with a couple dining at an adjacent table, threw an item of cutlery towards the man. Tarrant admitted to the BBC that he did jokingly lob some cutlery onto the couple's table after asking them to leave him alone to discuss work with his colleagues. He said, quote, I've no idea what this accuser's motives were. It genuinely makes no sense. I got back from the station at 1am and to this minute I'm completely bemused by what happened. On the 25th of May 2007, Tarrant was formally cautioned by the Nottinghamshire Constabulary with regard to the incident. I mean, what the hell? 
And Arlene, we hear a bit more about Arlene. She speaks to Chris. She's from Aberdeenshire, out of work at the moment. Desperately wants some money, is what Chris says, putting the words into her mouth there. And Denise talks about how the first thing she's do with the money is to have her roots done, which is, you know, nice. I mean, it's a real person they're insulting here, but still funny. Uh, Arlene herself says the first thing she do is buy a car. Dave then does the descending arpeggio of the music again, the and he does that quite a lot. And we then get into the first question, the collective name given to the structure of bones in the body. Uh, Skellington is said by Jim. Denise says nothing. Uh, Dave, Dave knows it as well. And a skeleton, of course, is a structural frame that supports an animal body. There are several different skeletal types. The exoskeleton, which is the stable outer shell of an organism. The endoskeleton, which forms a structure inside the body. And the hydroskeleton, a flexible skeleton supported by fluid pressure. The word comes from the Greek skeletos, meaning dried up. So Jim roars in approval, as he's answered correctly, £100 a piece of piss. Following this is a question two, asking what colour is normally associated with ecological groups, to which Jim says no to all but the last one, which is classic millionaire fashion. And this is what I love here, because like we've all watched millionaire, we've all watched game shows full stop, but especially millionaire. And there's just so many tropes of watching it, doing the diddly diddly do, saying no, no, yes, no to the answers, all that sort of stuff, saying he'd love her to win Chris. Like they hit all the marks here expertly. And then Dave says something, which this quote has just leaked into my everyday usage. This is something that I would always say to my dad, just out of context. And again, this is another thing that happens with Millionaire, where if someone has a different accent to you, I mean, if you're watching TV in general, someone has a different accent to you, and they say something that sounds a little silly to your ears, not even silly, but you know, a little different, a little foreign, you do repeat it. So, you know, in the case of Arlene from Aberdeen, she has Scottish Arlene, she says, D green, and of course, Dave mimics. D green. D green. Green. Right, you got 200 notes. Oh, hey! hey! 200 notes. This easy. Jim rumbles in his chair, happy to have got it right. His belly proudly pronounced at this point. I mean, Jim certainly ain't thinking about Barbara at this moment, that's for sure. And another funny line here comes where the hardest substance known to man is asked, and Jim immediately says duckers. <laughs> duckers who we've never met, obviously, but the line is just too perfect for description. And, you know, it's a funny bit of wordplay here from Jim, to be fair. Duckers who, at this point, we've heard about him being in prison, um, being at the Chinese. We'll hear about more of him later, um, being invited to the wedding, which he wasn't actually. You know, everyone cracks up at this line from Jim, and uh, rightly so. What's the hardest substance known to man? Duckers. <laughs> so the answer there was diamonds, but I believe them being the world's hardest material has actually lost that title a while ago to man-made nanomaterials. And there are other things found in like meteorites and stuff that are natural substances that are at least 58% harder than diamonds, at least according to this New Scientist article. And just keep that in mind that Jim made that joke as well, because um, there's a later question that Arlene is asked that kind of contradicts what Jim says there to a certain extent. Just, just keep that in your hat, but I'll remind you anyway. Next question is asked about pirates and Jolly Roger and what sort of flags they're known for rocking. The Jolly Roger, of course, is a traditional English name for the flags flown to identify a pirate ship about to attack during the early 18th century. The flag most commonly identified as a Jolly Roger today, which is a skull and crossbone symbol on the black flag, was used during the 1710s by a number of pirate captains, including Black Sam Bellamy, Edward England and John Taylor. It went on to become the most commonly used pirate flags during the 1720s, although other designs were also in use. It is sometimes claimed that the term derives from Jolie Rouge, pretty red, in reference to a red flag used by French privateers. This is sometimes attributed to red blood, symbolising violent pirates ready to kill. Denise, though, is more interested in Arlene's appearance than her nautical knowledge, though. Would have thought she'd put more lippy on for this, she says. Dave then points out that it's her nerves, and she keeps licking it off. And Dave and Denise laugh at this, and have a nice little moment of bonding after the arguing just before. And this is just a little funny observation, really, that, again, as I was saying earlier, it sort of goes beyond them just reacting to the questions. They're actually kind of interrogating everything they're seeing on the screen. Jim then chews for a brief second. The camera just holds on him for a moment. He seems to taste something. And then we get into a question about the stroke rating for each hole. The term used for that being par, of course. Bogey is another option, too, which Denise commentates on. Dad? Do you know what Dave calls crows? Bogeys? <laughs> <laughs> and I would 
all this <laughs> quite a watershed moment for me as a child when I watched this episode, when I realised that people have different terms for different things. Because I grew up with bogeys, that's what's in your nose, or bunnies as a child, but bogeys were called. But yeah, crows. I've heard crows later on in life. Like, that seems to be a um, more of a northern thing. But it's just kind of funny, that. But it was kind of this, this moment in my head. I was like, oh my god, there's a whole wide world out there. Dave then again sings the classic interstitial millionaire melody. And Arlene is on 1K with three lifelines. Might as well play, as Tarrant always says. And the next question concerns which group entered the charts in 1995 with Lifted. And we don't even have to get to option A here because Dave, Music Man Dave, knows it. I mean, compare this to Dave later in the series. It is Light and Day here. Lighthouse and Day, if you will. Because Dave knows it's the Lighthouse family. And damn, like, again, I just, I think I was just born in the perfect time to appreciate the Royal Family from a kid perspective. Because I remember Lighthouse family being massive at the time. Like, being on, like, Heart FM and BRMB and all our kind of Midland stations or whatever. And, you know... I went back on Spotify and listened to some of their songs, and they do have some uh, some pretty triumphant numbers. So who are the Lighthouse Family, or Lighthouse Family as they know? They are a British musical duo that rose to prominence in the mid-90s and initially remained active until the early 2000s. Vocalist Tunde Beiwu, sorry I'm probably saying that wrong, and keyboardist Paul Tucker formed the act in 1993 in Newcastle-upon-Tyne after meeting while studying at university and both working at the same bar. Their 1995 debut album, Ocean Drive, sold more than 1.8 million copies in the UK alone and established them as a popular, easy-listening duo throughout Europe. They are well known for their songs Lifted, Lost in Space, Ocean Drive, Rain Cloud and High, which also reached number one on the Australian singles charts. So yeah, Lifted, you probably know, um, you know, We Are Gonna Be, you know that one, um, The Sun Gonna Shine on Everyone. Like, they're very hymnal and gospel, and I always thought they were quite religious, because like, I went to a Catholic school, and they would always put hymn CDs on, like in mass and stuff, and it always sounded very Lighthouse Family to me, but I don't think they're necessarily in that direction, but yeah, the Lighthouse Family, and uh, I think the joke here, there's a few jokes here that I'm trying to unpick with this Lighthouse Family question, so I think the joke here is, you know, that Jim and Denise are so impressed with Dave, you know, he he's counting down, actually, he knows the answer from the off, you know, he's waiting for it to be declared, he pumps his fist massively, indulgently, hilariously, you know, Jim impressed even further. So Dave says, I've got everything they've ever done, which at this point, I mean, they've only released two albums. So I think that's kind of like he's making it seem like, you know, he's the equivalent of like a Bob Dylan bootleg collector or something. Like, you know, he owns every recording of everything when in actuality they only have two questions right. I mean, he's answered a 2K question, very easy question on the show, about a very popular band at the time. But still, I mean, let's let him have his moment, I suppose, you know. I think... um, Maybe Dave throws a bit of Lighthouse Family on at the Dave Best Disco. You know, I could see Lifted getting the place crunk, to be honest with you. And it's not like Dave just says this and then they move on. It's like Denise is really impressed. She, like, verbalises to her dad after looking at Dave to notice Dave. You know, look at Dave and he can curse. We then go into the 4K question where it asks what kind of animal is a hind? Jim then gets singing, but sans banjo this time, rather uttering in cadence, horses arse, horses arse, along with Chris's readings, which is uh, fantastic. And a hind, of course, is a deer, deer or true deer being hoofed ruminant mammals who form the family Cervidae. Male deers of all species, except the Chinese water deer, as well as the female reindeer, grow and shed new antlers each year. In this, they differ from the permanently horned antelope, which are part of a different family within the same order of evil-toed ungulates. Aren't you glad you listened to this show? So Jim thinks it was a horse, but it was a deer, though. It looks like a horse's ass from the back. I mean, funny logic, a good line. Jim is enjoying himself. You know, we watch him watching Millionaire. And then things kick up a gear in difficulty on the show. You know, we're getting into the big money now, and that tense, pulsing, heartbeat soundtrack of Millionaire starts to creep in. I mean, what a score it is as well. I love that music. And from this point... It's a little more complex for the royals and best, and probably not as enjoyable. Ethanol is the most common form of... Ethanol? Most common form... Oil. Plastic. Substance. Gas. Alcohol. Oh. Ethanol is the most common form of what substance? I mean, it's interesting that Jim says substance and is confused by that when he just made literally minutes before he made a joke about the hardest substance known to man being duckers so clearly he knows what it is or maybe it was more hardest that he was using for the gag but 
I just, it's kind of interesting that substance comes up twice in Millionaires. It's kind of weird that the question setters did that, but, you know, whatever. It's not the Royal Family writers, is it? They're just reacting to the show. But, yes, ethanol. Ethanol being a volatile, flammable, colourless liquid with a characteristic wine-like odour and pungent taste. It is a psychoactive drug, a recreational drug, and the active ingredient in alcoholic drinks. Ethanol is naturally produced by the fermentation of sugars by yeast or via petrochemical processes such as ethylene hydration. Denise struggles to even read the question, it seems. Chris repeats it, and Arlene seems to go for gas straight away, and then goes to phone a friend. It seems a little edited here. She literally just says gas, and then Tarrant sees what she wants to do for the lifelines. And Jim then makes reference to if they had Nana on the phone a friend. She just mentioned the precinct, you know, a story which is still talked about to this day, don't you know? Love that I get to mention there. And Arlene then is shown to be speaking to her sister, and we are reminded that this is quite an old episode of Millionaires. So this is something they had in the early seasons I do recall this where they had the actual briefcase of 50 pound notes right there you know the million in the case sort of thing whereas later on they would sort of take that away and have more of a transparent sort of base there but um but yeah nice signifier of the old series she then says a question Arlene and is misheard so she has to repeat it Cuts to Jim shaking his head, which again is something we've all done watching the show ourselves. And the camera then interestingly zooms in, the Royal Family camera zooms into the screen uh, of the CRT as if we're viewing it ourselves. It gets right up close to the grain of the picture, goes from Arlene to the counting down timer. I love that timer as well on me, you know, that circle, that 30 seconds, that eye, you know, it's just very iconic. It's got to be one of them four, Dave says. And here we just get snatches of overlapping inane dialogue. Kind of reminds me of, like, Robert Altman, if anyone's uh, familiar with that, uh, American director, Nashville, etc. You know, the timing of it all. Just just the way it kind of people just slightly talk over each other. Got to be one of them four. Yeah. Ah, oh, the bottle's gone, ain't it? She doesn't know. Tell you what, the bottle's gone. Oh, here you go for plastic. Oh, I'd love her to win, sure? Chris and all. Yeah. Sure? Mm, tell you something, I'd love her to win, Chris. You know, all this sort of thing, all this sort of babbling here. Uh, Jim crossing his fingers. She says plastic, though, Arlene. The answer's alcohol. And she gets it wrong. Alcohol? I thought you would have known that, Denise, Dave says. And Denise comes back with a line for the ages. I've never even drank ethanol. The camera then cuts back to Millionaire at a weird angle, which I really, really like. It's kind of unseen for the royal family, really. It's really up close to the TV. Chris and Arlene looking oddly yellow and sallow as we just see snatches of their face rather than a full-on shot. Denise says to Jim that she looks dead sad. She still won a grand, though, Jim says, which mm, is kind of fair enough. And I haven't commented on this really yet, but you can see all the clothes drawing behind Jim, too, on the rack as he's sitting down. Noticeably a sports sweater, which is of Anthony's, no doubt. She still seems gutted, though, Arlene, and Chris says they've got a little more time for one more game. Jim commentates on all the arses here. I mean, think about Tequin Whittock. He may have been down there. This is a little early for him, maybe. Jim talks about bums and arses, and Dave mimics the undies going, kind of similar to what he told Cheryl on the wedding day which she then relayed to Denise it's hard to hear the fastest finger first question exactly but it's about American geography Jim then goes to regale the duo Dave and Denise about the time he almost won a tenner on the lottery and this is an interesting story because it kind of shows the sort of guy Jim really is here he's not telling this as a joke as a the lottery ha ha I almost didn't win anything and what I was gonna win was a tenner kind of thing it's more miserly you know he's ruining it it's an actual shame let me tell you about the one that got away type thing and then the royals go down the avenue that we always love to see them explore nostalgia this time reminiscing not over chocolate adverts but game shows of the past you know another classic thing to dwell upon Denise tries to remember the old quiz show that Jim used to really like, and I love how she can't quite recall who Roy Walker is at first, but of course it's catchphrase that she's talking about here, and both Jim and Dave far out on it, and yeah, catchphrase is a classic, of course, I mean, who didn't love catchphrase when it was on? And Roy Walker, Roy Walker, Roy Walker's still alive, and I don't mean to be morbid in that way, I'm glad about that, but I just went on his wiki and I expected him to have passed recently, but no, no, Roy Walker's still with us, born 1940 in July, is a Northern Irish television personality and comedian who worked for many years as both a presenter and comedy actor. He is best known as the original host of the game show Catchphrase between 1986 and 1999, and is one of the stars of the comedy showcase The Comedians. 
Catchphrase is a British game show based on the short-lived American game show of the same name. It originally aired on ITV in the UK between January 86 and April 2004, and currently Stephen Mulhern is hosting a revival that started on ITV in 2013. Catchphrase was presented by Northern Irish comedian Roy Walker from its 86 premiere until 99, airing weekly at night. Nick Weir took the programme over in 2000 and hosted it until 2004. Yeah, I seem to remember that guy. And yeah, Catchphrase has many, many funny moments, of course. One of the funniest moments of the show being the Snake Charmer incident. I mean, you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with that. But basically, uh, so this is what it says here. One of the funniest moments of the show's history included a ready money bonus catchphrase where the answer to the puzzle was Snake Charmer. However, the puzzle wasn't covered in such a way. If you're not familiar with Catchphrase, basically you sort of, um, you know, you buzz in. And then if you get something right, you can reveal one little tile of a bigger picture and try and have a guess at it. However, the puzzle wasn't covered in such a way which caused the audience, the contestants, and host Tom O'Connor to cry uncontrollably as the game went on, as it appeared Mr. Chips and the Snake were doing something sexual. Originally broadcast on the 30th of December 1997 as a ninth episode of Series 10, Digital Challenge Channel sometimes broadcasts this episode, albeit with modified animation, and it has appeared on many outtake and blooper shows. And straight away, upon the declaration of catchphrase, the boys are into some impressions. Oh, catchphrase. Oh. <laughs> say what you say. If you say it, say it. <laughs> oh, that's a good answer, but it's not right. <laughs> <laughs> say what you say. If you say it, say it. <laughs> Dave says, say what you see for a second and third time, getting more and more animated each time. And on the third time, even getting a little maestro conductor's animation in. Denise appears to wait for him to inevitably say the fourth time and then tells him to stop it, like a child almost. Dave seems lost in the character of Roy Walker, though, responding to Denise not as her husband, but as Roy, saying, I'm only saying what I see. And then Denise lays the law down in a hilarious way to me. Not saying cut it out or anything else fittingly prosaic. Rather, she takes the catchphrase itself as a put down. You're not seeing it, so stop saying it. Reminds me of when she said, I don't want exits singing access all areas at my baby's christening. I mean, there's the detail that Denise sometimes goes into in her insults. Terrific. I just noticed as well at this point that Dave is wearing a jacket. Untroubled, unlike the last time he wore it indoors. But Barb isn't here, I guess, so there's less maternal mivering. I mean, where is Barb anyway? The clan clearly seem to have lost any interest they may have had at this point. They seem unmivered. Jim asks Dave who the best quiz master is, and he fires back Les Dennis, who Jim has already insulted in the second episode, you'll remember, uh, talking about putting his brain into a hazelnut shell and it would still rattle. Jim disagrees with the patented uh-uh, saying Bob Monkhouse. And Bob Monkhouse, well, Robert Allen Monkhouse, OBE, born in June 28 and passed away on the 29th of December 2003, was an English entertainer and comedian. He was well known as a host of television game shows, including The Golden Shot, Celebrity Squares, Family Fortunes, and Wipeout. In his autobiography, he admitted to hundreds of sexual liaisons and affairs, but claimed that he only undertook this course of action because his wife was unfaithful. His lovers before his second marriage, including the actress Diana Dawes, about whose parties he later commented after her death, quote, the awkward part about an orgy is that afterwards you're not too sure who to thank. <laughs> Monkhouse was also a vocal supporter of the Conservative Party for some years. He later told his friend Colin Edmonds that this may have been a mistake, but that he wanted to be associated with a winner, and he knew Thatcher could not lose the 87 general election. And Jim then brings up another Hall of Famer, Bruce Forsyth. Bruce Forsyth, Sir Bruce Joseph Forsyth Johnson, CBE, who unfortunately passed away in 2017, August 2017, was a British entertainer and presenter whose career spanned more than 70 years. Forsyth came to the national attention from the late 50s through the ITV series Sunday Night at the London Palladium. He went on to host several game shows, including The Generation Game, Play Your Cards Right, The Price is Right, and You Bet. He co-presented Strictly Come Dancing from 2004 to 2013, and in 2012, Guinness World Records recognised Forsyth as having the longest television as having the longest television career for a male entertainer. I mean, you know, I'm trying to think who they would mention now if they did this episode today. Obviously, Bradley Walsh is there, Alexander Armstrong. I mean, God, that is a debate, isn't it? Are you a pointless household? Are you a chase household? I mean, you can kind of guess maybe I'm more on the pointless side. They don't actually see pointless live, but I think it's interesting here on a class level what sort of games your hosts are invoking. The very popular ones, you know, the very genial ones. They're not thinking more of the cerebral Bamba Gascoins or... Magnus Magnuson, you know, stuff like that. And Dave, you know, he has a lot in his locker when it comes to impressions here. Tackling old Brucey. <laughs> oh, here they are. They're so appealing. OK, dollies, do your dealing. Hey, <laughs> 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 Lower, lower, 
Gotta love that rubbery voice. Dave also making the weird gestures of, you know, putting a fist to his forehead, which I'm a little confused what that means. Can anyone elucidate me? The Royal Ramble Pod at gmail.com. Um, does it mean he's a dickhead or he's bold? Or I kind of get what it means, but I'd like to know an exact uh, definition, please. Jim chortles heavily at this. Denise, too, properly laughing. It's great, you know. Dave is really one of them. Like, they have a great moment here. Um, further Forsyth takes come. Jim kind of mimics his higher than an eight and adjusts his hair like a toupee. And Dave, Dave then goes too far. Apparently, this is too far. And his next impression is not well received. <laughs> hey, remember him? Remember him? Ooh, look at the muck here. Ooh, have a shut that door. Dave, don't do that. I never knew who this was, actually. Literally until looking up the notes for this episode. This is Larry Grayson that Dave is making reference to. And his fruity, to coin Dave's term, his fruity impression really doesn't hold water here. You know, he holds his hands limp. He really retreats back into himself. It's hilarious to me. I mean, it, it's campers or heck. And a side that we don't usually see from the lackadaisical Dave Best. And who is Larry Grayson? Well, Larry Grayson, who lived from August 23 to January 95, was born William Sully White. He was an English comedian and television presenter who was best known in the 70s and early 80s. He is best remembered for hosting the BBC popular series The Generation Game, and for his high camp and English music hall humour. His manner, style and charisma endeared him to several generations and influenced many of today's performers. He could get a laugh merely by flicking a wrist and saying, look at the muck on here, which is what Dave does, or by touching his head and saying, must wash my hair, it's all gone limp. Larry Grayson's world revolved around a myriad of peculiar characters and comic situations, like a repertory theatre played out for the imagination. Larry often gave exposure to characters such as Slack Alice, Apricot Lil who works in the jam factory, Pop It In Pete the Postman. Now apparently you say the things I've had through my letterbox there. I have heard Pop It In Pete said before, so maybe that was a Larry reference. Self-raising Fred, who was the baker, and Everard, who is Larry's close friend, who was enigmatic and uh, proudly named. So Jim really talks to Dave here, admonishes him a little bit. Dave, don't do that. And Denise looks upon disapprovingly. I suppose it's because he's playing gay and that's a bad thing, I guess. I mean, we've seen Jim talk about Anthony being a little bummer, calling Lawrence Sewell and Bowen, Nancy boy. So yeah, I mean, Jim is homophobic. I mean, that's the true bummer. He doesn't have much to say, Dave, in return, and just kind of looks over to his screen. He gets another little squeeze of pomp out under his breath, as if he was in full flourish and suddenly had to put a cap on it. And on the TV, Chris is still chatting, but the focus suddenly shifts to Barbara. Steps can be heard. Jim is mouth agape. Jim says, "Uh uh-uh, under his breath, and in comes Barbara with a coat on. She's done what she threatened to do at the start of the episode. She's got on her coat and went somewhere. The mood is tense. The knees moves up for her, taking the ashtray with her, taps her usual space affectionately, and Jim stares with wide eyes in fear, in uncertainty. Denise pulls out a ciggy kindly for Barb and lights it. Standard gesture. Barb hasn't looked at Jim yet, who is still side-eyeing the situation. You are right, ma'am? Denise asks, staring at her, keeping an eye on her. Noticeably, Denise is sitting where Barbara was in the last episode, as she looked upon her own mother, Norma, lovingly, who was sleeping at the time. I like that parallel. The camera doesn't move, but from behind Denise's profile, Dave rises, asking, You are right, Barbara? I mean, he winces slightly. You know how it sounds. Like, these lines are just scored into any fan's mind. He smiles. He's, you know, he's trying to be kind here. You can also hear Millionaire playing with that descending refrain, and Dave doesn't sing along. Dave's attentions are with Barbara at this point. Jim. Jim then ventures something himself. You are all right, Bab. I have to be, don't I? I have to be, don't I? I mean, man, that is just painful because, yeah, she really does. I mean, if she walks out for good or just lives in open misery, then it's no good for anyone. And the family is clearly more important to Barbara than her own self-worth. So she struggles and toils and puts up with it all. Jim lies barefaced, of course, saying we've been walking the length of the neighbourhood looking for you, (laughs) going out their minds. Barb says she just went for a little walk to clear her head. Is anything the matter, Denise and asks, which again is infuriating both for Barbara and us as viewers as we literally just saw Barbara laying it all out for Denise about her woes. And Barb answers her in such a motherly way. Nothing that won't keep, she says. She's kept it in for 27 years now, which points to her maybe being unhappy from the off. I mean, perhaps hyperbole. Reminds me of Norma and her being unhappy in her marriage to Barbara's dad, the freehand tool grinder. And Jim has nothing to say to what he's just heard. Seems hurt. Takes it in. 
pauses, raises his eyebrows slightly, and then Jim tries to make it better, tries to find comparisons, you know, uh, silver lining, stating that there's a woman just like her on the change on Millionaire, and she just made a thousand pounds, so it's not all doom and gloom. I mean, Christ, Jim, I know you think you're being kind here, but that's so insulting. He really doesn't see it, does he? Thinks that the menopause is the problem. Tells Barbara and her change to sit tight, as if it's something alongside her, rather than part and parcel of her being. And then declares, shock horror, that he's going to make the tea. Something to which the three of them, Dave, Denise and Barbara, they all turn to him in shock, quieted. Absolute silence greets Jim. And okay, nice gesture, I suppose, even though it's literally pouring boiling water in a cup and, you know, you can't even get that right, as we'll learn, because it's Jim. But, you know, he's pretending like this is some grand gesture when it's very regular. I love the refrain of, I am making a brew. You know, he does go a bit further as he's leaving his throne, though, telling Barb to actually think about bakery talking points in advance as he's interested, apparently, now and ready to listen. The three of them seated say nothing, still stunned. Chris, on the TV, asks a good question, which English county has a border with only one other. And Jim comes, shouts D, which shocks them slightly. You see Barbara sort of start a little bit. And Jim is just adding loads of details here about the tea, thinking that his insights are valuable, getting the water really piping hot, etc. I mean, he's in grovel mode, basically, and it's pretty weird to see him as such. Barb, who is cleaning a bit of ash off her top, looks at Denise with a slight sneer, as if to say... What is going on right now? Like, this is bizarro world. Denise also looks at Dave, whose eyes are on the TV, but who shakes concurrently in surprise. Jim shouts from the kitchen, asking after the sugar bowl. It's where it always is, but he doesn't know where it is, of course. That's her job or Ant's job. And from behind, like at the start of the episode, we can hear clattering. Denise also just scratches and sniffs her nose slightly. I mean, these little details are amazing. That's probably just something Carolina Hunt just did or whatever, but I love it. It makes the show feel more alive. Denise also turns to her mom, smiling as the noise continues, kind of saying like, well, what's dad like, kind of thing. And Jim is again struggling to find the penguins. On the TV, we can hear that someone has won 4K, which is much more than Arlene, which, again, they've cut the episode slightly here because that doesn't really make sense. Someone couldn't have done that in the time, but still, it ain't meant to be really, really real, is it? The camera then follows Barb. Barb gets up, camera handheld, follows Barb right into the kitchen as Jim is filling the pot. Barb finds the box, the Tupperware box, grabs them, the penguins that is, and then Jim then holds her wrist lovingly as she reaches across in a very touching moment. Hey Barb, we'll get through this change thing together. You know what I mean, kid. The use of kid, the tenderness. Obviously Jim has completely misread the situation, but perhaps Barbara sees as a progress of some sort as he's been much worse when Norma has been round, and no doubt prior to that too. She smiles at him and says, yeah, looks at him, smiles to herself, seems happy about it in some way, takes her small victories where she can. Jim then seems happier in himself too, dances and sings to himself, shooting out little quips from a PG Tips advert from 1971, the chimp one, which Barbara and co have already said that they enjoy so much, or one of the chimp ones, there are many, many of them. Jim then brings in the tray, still laughing over the advert, pours it out for Dave, a cuppa, and passes it across, then Bar points to her and pours. In the background, we can hear Chris chatting about the P.O. box to send in your entries to apply as the show closes. Jim hands one then to the knees, mentioning the grapefruit, and sits back in his own chair with his own and gets some real deep delight out of his copper, it seems. He's proper satiated, like, you know, we've seen him like that with a bacon butty and stuff like that, or we will at least see that. Barb then looks at him, wondering what's in it. Dave is worried too at Jim. Like, everyone's like, what the hell is going on? Jim doesn't need money, though, on the millionaire topic he decries, with tea and family like this. This seemingly, then, isn't just a a once-in-a-blue-moon thing from Jim, though, on the account of Barbara. No, this is a turning point, it looks like, for Jim, who is opening his simple, modest home up to the family tomorrow for some fine dining. Barbara can't believe it. Hey, how does that grab you, Barb? Okay, Dave. I love the way you... Well, I believe it when I see it. And Denise on screen is dumbfounded, but Jim goes further talking about his onion gravy, delicately caressing the fluffy mash which will be straddled by two succulent sausages. I mean, Jim is in a good humorous mode here of his pomp. You know, despite it being bangers and mash, he's making it sound like M&S food, you know. Barb says she'll believe it when she sees it, and, you know, you do believe that Jim is going to do it. But then Dave throws a spanner in the works, realises that it's a dance final in the feather, so they can't do it. I mean, obviously, 
they could just do it the next night, <laughs> like, you know, or the night after. They could just say, next week, let's do it when we've got a free day. But Jim clearly thinks he's out of it. Jim is just going to forget all about this when his cup of tea is done. You know, I doubt he's going to be even interested in the bakery. I mean, look at the next episode. Look at the next series. Look at all the stuff we see. This is not this grand watershed moment for Jim and his relationship with Barbara. You know, this is just an important episode for them to show that Tempers are running high, and, you know, we needed to see the reality of this. We couldn't just see Barbara being punished, 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 because there'd be no fun in that. You know, we need to see some sort of catharsis, as, as, as little as it is, and as misinformed as it is. At least Jim is kind of being kind to Barbara for a second. And I love the fact, in these final seconds of the show, the camera's all on Jim at this point. And obviously, when Dave says that and Jim realises, it's not going to happen. It's the thought that counts, Jim says. I mean, it's just a thought he's just had, and it's like... He's not even cooking anything that delicate, is he, or anything. He's cooking something he would like to eat. It's not pasta and stuff like that that have been uh, fated as, like, some exotic treat or whatever. So, yeah, with that what, we have a very comedic end and kind of a perfect ending to uh, a perfect episode. All right, and that about wraps us up. So, as always, if you enjoy the show and you want to give back to the show in some way, there's many ways you can do it for free, of course. You can leave us a review on iTunes. You can subscribe on YouTube. You can tell a friend. You can check us out on Spotify. You can share it, you know, on whatever platforms you are able to. Uh, the Raw Ramble Pod at gmail.com. Please get in touch with me there. If you want to come on for the quiz, if you just want to chat to me, if you want to just correspond in some way, it's always great to hear from you, and I'll read them out at the top of the show. And if you want to go a little bit further, if you really, really you dig the Royal Ramble pod and uh, you want to help keep the lights on over here at HQ then you can go on to Patreon and you can support us over there and basically that gives you premium access to the show so it's always a month ahead on the Patreon with the new episode there so uh, yeah this has been Tom as always go back through the archive check out all the old episodes you'll always have the rules to keep you company and I'll be there as well so uh, yeah this is Tom the Royal Ramble pod take it easy Tom Quee presents the Royal Ramble an episode-by-episode celebration of the classic British sitcom, The Royal Family. To get in touch with the show, email us at theroyalramblepod at gmail.com.